All right, good evening, everybody. Good evening, folks. Thank you all for coming down tonight. Uh, as Mitchell mentioned, we are live from Books and Books in Coral Gables, Florida, through the generous support of the Knight Foundation. And this evening, Books and Books, in collaboration with the Creative Writing Department at the University of Miami, is thrilled to present the Voices of Our Nation Arts Foundation faculty readings. We have a long list of very distinguished authors that are going to be speaking tonight. And here to kick off the evening for us, please welcome to the podium a very special guest. He is the Executive Director of VONA, Mr. D.M. Jones. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, thank you all for coming out, um, and welcome to Articulations. Um, as Victor said, this is our faculty reading for the second week of the Vona Voices Writing Workshop in our inaugural year here at the University of Miami in Coral Gables. Wow. Are there any writers in the house? I just want to let you all know it's really a thrill to be with you all. It's a thrill to be in the best independent bookstore in America, yeah. Books and Books. Um, good evening. As Victor mentioned, I'm D.M. Jones, the Executive Director of the Voices of Our Nation's Arts Foundation. And you haven't seen me this week, and I'd like to thank my wife, Dr. Carol Penn, for supporting me and making it possible for me to be able to travel today, just um, overcoming. Many of you are visitors here to Miami, and you're sitting in what we call the magic city, the literary treasure, right here at Books and Books. I'd like to thank Mitch, Christine, Aaron, Stephanie, Victor, and the entire Books and Books staff for hosting and promoting our faculty readings last week and this week. The Voices of Our Nation's Arts Foundation, or VONA as we become fondly known, began in 1999 as a placemaker in the creative writing field to provide a safe haven and a platform for writers of color to hone their respective crafts and to launch forward and to break open the walls of the literary canon to include our wonderful expansive range of voices from communities of color. Our voices have been marginalized, overlooked, and discouraged, and we at Vona are here to turn that around. Co-founders Elmaz Abinader, Juno Diaz, Victor Diaz, and I began this journey in San Francisco, the San Francisco Bay Area over 15 years ago. And our home was there, but as we presented last fall, we've migrated to Miami. We've landed here in Magic City because we, we came to discover the commonality of our mission with the University of Miami by invitation in 2012 by Evelina Galang, the director of the MFA writing program, one of, one of our faculty members and one of our board members. She had a vision, and thank you, Evelina, for inviting us, starting um, this wonderful relationship and creating a new home for us. We piloted our first regional program in January 2012, and after two years of successfully doing that, the administration of the University of Miami gave us an invitation that the timing was just perfect and we took that as an opportunity to come home to Miami. So here we are in this vibrant literary city. Um, how many people traveled to come here? Wow. You know, we actually projected that, you know, we're moving to Miami and we'll probably have a drop off in applications. This was a record year of applications for us. <laughs> Almost got us in trouble in the dorms. <laughs> they said, well, you know, the hotel's down the street. And we said, no. But we hope all of the writers who've traveled to come participate this week have found what, they came, what they're looking for. Um, our community is expansive. We have over 2,200 alum who have been with us over the last 16 years. And thank you for joining us. 
But today is not a history lesson about Bono, <laughs> unless you want one. <laughs> but this is Articulations, and I'd like to introduce our MC tonight, Adrian Castro. Since many of you are, are new to Miami, I'd just like to um, say that perhaps you were here at our reception at the Betsy last week and you had a taste of Adrian's poetry. He is a poet, writer, an artist, and an acupuncturist. He, okay. Born in Miami, his work combines Afro-Caribbean myths, history, and rhythms to explore Afro-Caribbean American identity. He's the author of three collections of poetry, Cantos to Blood and Honey, Wise Fish, Tales in 6-8 Time, and Handling Destiny. The New York Times has praised Castro's poetry as a serious and seriously enjoyable contribution to our flourishing Latino literary scene. That said, Adrian, take it away. Okay, we have a packed house. Wonderful. I love this. Um, thanks to um, all the staff at Vona for inviting me to MC this. This is uh, this is such a such a privilege because so many of the people that are that are reading tonight are not only great writers, not only great writers that I respect and admire, but friends as well. And uh, and a few that I I've not, I've didn't know, you know, hadn't met before. And this week I've, I've had the opportunity of, of meeting them. I'm going to start the evening with uh, Lina, as my daughter uh, likes to call her. Evelina Galan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you see where it says M? I know what the M stands for, <laughs> but M for you guys, Mama Evelina Galang, <laughs> because, you know, she really made this thing happen here. I know with a lot, of, a lot of sweat and a lot of effort. She's the author, wait, excuse me, I'm past 40, so. <laughs> Is the author of Her Wild American Self, the novel, One Tribe, and Angel de la Luna and the Fifth Glorious Mystery. She is currently writing Lola's House, Women Living with War, and is at work on a new novel, Beautiful Sorrow, Beautiful Sky. Please welcome the best pantsit maker this side of Manila, Evelina Galang. Thank you, Adrian. Wow, it is a packed house. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Miami. So this reading, I'm going to do a little reading here, and I'm going to dedicate it to my Vona Fiction 2015 workshop. Are you in the house? All week long, they have been open-hearted, open-minded, and they have been sharing their works in progress. And while I could read to you from one of the books that are on the shelves here at Books and Books that Mitchell Kaplan has brought in, um, I think I will do the same and open up my, my works in progress to you, my workshop. <laughs> so here we go. This is, this is from Beautiful Sorrow, Beautiful Sky. And um, it, it's based on, uh, all I'll tell you is, as, you, as many of you know, I've been working with the stories of surviving Filipina comfort women of World War II. And if you haven't uh, been watching the news, I can let you know that back at, during that time, there were 200,000 women and girls taken and placed into military sex slave camps. Um, I have had the good fortune, fortune and the blessing to know many of these women um, who in the Philippines went through uh, ho this horrible experience, this human rights violence. Um, and if you've been paying attention to the news, you know that Japan is trying to erase this story. So I am here as a writer, as a Filipina, and as a Vona faculty member to tell you, you cannot erase our stories. So with that, I will read to you. This is um, my main character, Dolor Angara, and it's in 1945. 
Do you remember, he asked her, now and then. And she would close her eyes to think of that time when they were apart, to remember the feel of wet mud covering her body, the blanket of banana leaves keeping her hidden from the sun. But all she saw were his words. All that came to her was a picture of the story he had painted. I was alone, she'd ask him. He'd nod, hoping. And we were just outside of the city, yes. It was morning, it was. My arrow, yes, not a cloud in the sky. Ongla, she said, that's what you told me. I remember that. You do, you remember. I remember that you told me. She wonders what would have been, uh, she wonders what she would have done if the roles were reversed. If he had been lost during the war, would she have searched for him or given up? Would she have scooped him out of some ditch near Pampanga or would she have walked right by him? She thinks maybe she would have just kept walking. If she was on that road and he was whimpering below the brush, would she have heard the wind or the birds or the rooster crowing? She would have dismissed the very idea of him, moved on. She saw the disappointment on his face, and she felt a little guilty for not remembering. But then she'd remind him, Nawala ako sa sarili ko. How do you expect me to remember? Right, mahal, he'd say. But the thing is, she did. At night, when they were in bed, and after she drifted off to sleep, she saw the clouds shifting from behind the green fronds. She smelled the mud, practically tasted it, in her sleep, she'd stick her fingers into her ear to clear the dirt from them. She conjured up the war in bits and pieces. She didn't see the fighting as much as she felt the pain, the pain of it in her bones, aching in her arms. She smelled burning flesh. She imagined um, sores on her belly, and just below, she felt something was slicing her in two. Sometimes the war seemed so real she would jolt right out of bed and find herself being rocked by him, his thick arms holding her down to keep her from flying off the bed. Just a dream, he would say to her, just a dream. Gising ka na, mahal. Gising ka na. For a long time after the war, she would look at Andres and the way he smiled at her and brought her meals, the way he held her hand and she would say to herself, this man really loves me. Who is he? Everyone told her, especially her mother-in-law, he is your asawa hija, your childhood sweetheart, mahal mo. Paano ba yan, she'd think. If he is my husband, then why does he seem like a stranger to me? At night, when he was fast asleep, she'd examine his face from her side of the bed, the slope of his nose and the way his jaw was set so tight like he was ready to fight. He had long, dark lashes like a girl's, and his wavy hair was always swept up away from his forehead. She thought he was handsome and kind, but she didn't know him. And if they were husband and wife, then where was their house? Why were they staying at his mother's house? The whole family nursed her back, feeding her little spoonfuls of her life, asking her to listen, just listen, and maybe something would come back to her. She didn't think they were lying, and she was falling in love with them, e even as they wondered who they really were. He was so patient with her, and he didn't seem to mind when she refused him sex. Sleeping was the worst. The dreams came fragmented and confusing. When she slept, she relinquished control over what her mind would do. She did not remember. The stories that her family gave her never grew back into memories, but other images, like little pieces of shrapnel, they began to emerge in her sleep. Sometimes it was the bright lights of a bomb and the thunder that came with it. Sometimes it was the image of a bayonet slicing through the air. She woke up one night clutching her chest and ripping open her nightgown and found a scar the size of a cigarillo branded between her two small breasts. Another time she woke and she felt the swelling between her legs, but there was nothing there. She couldn't understand why Andres loved her, 
why he searched through several barrios and little farms in search of her. Try to love him, she told herself. Try. In those first few, few months, he was so patient with her, and she could do anything at all, and he would respond with only kind words or a touch. Sometimes she tried to be mean just to see what he would do, to see if that would send him to another room, but it never did. And soon she found herself gazing at him when he was unaware. The house had servants, but he insisted on serving her meals and bathing her. He insisted on combing her hair. He sang to her when he did these things, or he'd tell her stories of their childhood. He told her she used to chase after him, but, only, but she only smiled when he said this. She could not imagine it. She'd answer, and he would confess that it was he who pursued her. One night, he was preparing her bath. She told him, Andres, I can bathe myself. I am not an invalid. Are you sure, Mahal? You're still weak. You can't even stand up by yourself. This was true. It seems that whatever happened during the war had stripped her of all her strength, and rising up from a chair or the bed was for her the hardest thing to do. She made an attempt to rise from the chair, where she watched him filling a basin full of water. She pushed on the chair and tried to carry her weight off, off that chair, but her arms felt faint and she could feel the sweat rising from her skin. He had stopped what he was doing, and he watched her from afar, with two arms ready to scoop her up should she fall. After the third attempt, she shook her head, and when she saw him waiting like that, her heart filled up with such a warmth that even in her desire to be free of him, she said, Sige na nga, come get me. Thank you. Andrew X. Pham <laughs> is a memoirist known for his book, Catfish and Mandala. He has, he has launched a culinary project titled A Southeast Asian Love Affair, my cookbook dairy, diary of travels, flavors, and memories. Please welcome Andrew X. Pham. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is for my class. And, uh, you know, I, I have to follow Evelina's lead and read stuff that I've never read before. Ow. And this is fresh off the press. And, and you shouldn't feel so bad that I'm telling you to rewrite and rewrite because this is the third or fourth draft myself. So even without anybody reading it, I know it's bad, so I have to rewrite it. <laughs> without anybody telling me that I have to rewrite it. Anyway, this is about um, my grandmother's time, you know. She, she was in the Indochina period in Vietnam. Uh, and the strange thing was her husband was a Japanese guy. And this is the night, bef this is the moment before she was captured by the French and raped and tortured and uh, a son resulted from that rape, and he's still alive today in Vietnam. So he's half Vietnamese, half French. But this is the last moment of her life before she was captured with her husband. All her life, she remembered that she had been awakened on that pivotal day. In her 30th year, by a lullaby, her mother used to sing. It drew Thuy from her slumber and left her at the final hush of night when silence had blanketed all but the churring crickets. She came from a long line of dreamwalkers, and she knew it was a powerful omen. 
outside the awning window of bamboo split, vaporous rags passed before a sickle moon caught high in the branches of the longan tree. A breeze from the woods rustle across the dry fields and carry into their small room the musty, bitter scent of undergrowth and decaying leaves, a season turning. A tremor fluttered through her ribs. Tui resisted the urge to reach for her husband, Takeshi, an arm's length away, the bed suddenly as wide as an empty plain. She feared the anxiety in her breath might wake him. Takeshi slept shirtless, on his back, his wiry corded arm at his side like a soldier. He was 47 years old, gaunt and tanned to a deep shade of teak from fishing the coastal waters. A sheet of beating sweat coated his hairless limbs and torso and trickled in rivulets down his skin as smooth as a woman's. Even in repose, he looked very much shipwrecked the last Japanese in the province. Of his group of five officers who remained in Vietnam after the Second World War, two had returned to Japan within the first six months after completing the covert transfer of Japanese armaments to the Viet resistance. One had perished of disease, another was killed in a French ambush, ambush with a platoon of resistance fighters. Takeshi was the last and only man with a native wife and child who hung on against order of repatriation and the wishes of his aging parents, waiting on Hokkaido for the return of their only son. The rooster crow in the dark yard, Takeshi saw her watching him, as was her habit. She dabbled the sweat from his chest with the cuff of her sleeve. They faced each other, exchanging breath. Did you dream well, she whispered. I saw you in my dream, he replied. A good dream, then. She felt a quiver of premonition. I saw you in my home by the sea in Hokkaido, our children playing on the beach. Were we happy there? Yes, very. Are we happy now? He paused. She brushed the hair at his temple where flecks of gray had blown in and remained. He had turned the mid-corner of life, attended by morning aches and minor injuries. She could taste it in his mouth. You're not happy. She knew something of homesickness. I did not say that. She hushed him with the fingers to his lips. Their little family anchor him here. She knew that a life, even one readily sacrificed for the sake of love, could not be lived solely in, within the walls of a house. He must be the loneliest man in this province. She sensed the yearnings beneath his quiet reassurances that there was satisfaction in working the land. Life here was subsistence, survival. It offered him little else. She knew it was unfair that he endured great hardship to be with her, to have descended to this from power and luxury. It remained unanswered, the question that had formed in her mind since the day he came into her shop with a bouquet of flowers to request permission to woo her. A 25-year-old single mother how would they reconcile their vastly different worlds to be together? He squeezed her hand. Let's take the ship to Hokkaido. You will see why I talk too much about the miss of Kushiro. I will catch the most amazing fish for you in that cold ocean. You will see my home, and I will present you to my parents. My father needs to bless his grandson. We can return when there is peace, when it's safe. The longer we stay here, the harder it will be to leave. The fighting will only get worse. Mm, someday we'll go, someday. She curled into him, nestling her head in the crook of his neck, to stem his sudden outburst. Japan seemed so far away, foreign, unreal. She was afraid she was selfish. Time was a scarlet river, best travel in the company of loved ones. It was not in her to leave for her friends and family. She was not ready. 
What did she know of the politics of war or exotic countries? She could not imagine living in a land populated with Japanese, or French for that matter. She suffered from the prejudices of the colonized. He sighed in exasperation. I love you, but you are a very stubborn woman. <laughs> yes, I know, but you are the buffalo <laughs> in this relationship. He smiled. I am a fool. Do you really believe that? She asked into his chest. I don't know anymore, do, we, do you? There was a time when he spoke with great confidence. The empire's defeat had reduced him from a major in charge of the occupying forces in Fantiet to a fugitive, irrelevant in the new colonial conflict between the French and the Vietnamese. It had seemed so plausible, inevitable even, that Vietnam would gain its independence. They had been on the cups of freedom. A life here would have been possible for a Japanese veteran like him. When she could not speak the truth, she retreated into silence. She pillowed her head on his chest and listened to his heart, which she knew with clarity would be the truest heart she would receive her entire life. She placed her hand in his and ground the knuckles into his cup palm, pestle and mortar, their private gesture. Bands of indigo and violet open on the horizon, bickering starling flock in the trees. In the other room, her 48-year-old aunt unfolded her limb and leveraged herself off the hard divan she shared with Twee's three-year-old son and seven-year-old daughter. Aunt Coy fumbled with a back door latch, shuffle out, and wash her face at the rain cistern beneath the eaves of the house with considerable clattering of buckets, as if to remind Twee that it was market day and they needed an early start. The children slept on undisturbed. Stay, he whispered. We need supply for the shop, Twee fought off his hands. She put her feet onto the floor, but he sat up and caught her from behind. He pulled her into a crushing embrace with his rangy arms of knots and cables, of scars and sun-charred flesh, the calluses on his palm pressed into her as hard as pebbles, her head low back against his, the stubble on his chin rough against her skin, his breath hot on the nape of her neck, how long exhalation, tender as whispers. She drew in his woodsy scents, night dissipated around them like a slow-moving fog, leaving their limbs awash with the lilac luminance of pre-dawn. That was how she remembers him, how she remembered them. They were whole then. They had all that could be good and kind and sweet between two people. They were perfect filled with the luxury of love, encapsulated in those final pure moments, preserved like statues. And still, she believed some part of them remained in that space, some part of their spirit reside there, unassailable by the hardship and darkness to come. That's the art and the tragedy of dreamwalking. One does not ask, what if? After the reality has unfolded, it is not in the dreamwalker's lexicon. Things, events, section of life played out like deja vu. It is always too late. They've been here before. It's inescapable. When it comes to matters of Cuba, for a long time, there's one person who I always want to 
tweak their 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 recesses. Los sesos. And that's Achi, Achi Ovejas. Not only because she knows it intellectually, but because she has done something or did something that very few people who know about Cuba can actually have the wherewithal, los cojones, to do it. She was basically living there while being a citizen of the United States, doing this in a time when it was not very, it was very dangerous to do that. She didn't exactly live there, but she was there long enough to absorb the life of contemporary Cuba. And that is, you can tell that in her work, because the, 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 the depth of, the, of the, the pulse of Cuba is in her work. And you can't get that by reading, by even living in Miami, you can't get that. So this is, this is one of the things that makes Ashi uh, such as a unique and special talent. She is the author of a critically acclaimed novels, Ruins, Memories, and Days of Awe, of Awe, as well as other books of fiction and the poetry chapbook, This is What Happened in Our Other Life. As a translator, she was a finalist for Spain's Esther Benitez Translation Prize from the National, Trans uh, National Translators Association. Please welcome Achi Ovejas. Thank you very, very, very much. I want, want to thank... Hello, hello. What did I do? It's on now? Oh, we didn't do anything. Can you hear me? Nope. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. I just needed to turn it off and on. All right. I just wanted to thank a couple people really fast before I um, start my reading. I want to thank, first of all, all of you for being here. And I want to thank Vona for inviting me to be here this week, but especially Elmaz, who made this very possible. And I want to thank Evelina, who has been comforting me all week long. Um, and I especially want to thank my class, because they made a lot of accommodations for me and also trusted me with amazing hardcore work that was inspiring and soaring, and I'm gonna be taking that stuff with me for months. It's gonna be feeding me. Um, I'm gonna follow in the footsteps of everyone else who's been reading and read something brand new. Haven't even read it aloud. Um, this is called The Collector. What is your name? He looked at his passport. There was no question it was him in the photo. That was his name on the blue paper and on the visa attached askew to the page. On the tarmac, steam rose from the airplane waiting to leave the island. He turned. Behind him, past the shadows and the glass partition, there were others without passports, without visas, schools of them beyond the moist and blurry pane. What is your name? The uniformed guard at the checkpoint asked again. The guard's eyes darted between the passport and the man, still looking over his shoulder to the shimmering aquarium. The man opened his mouth and pronounced his name with a questioning lilt. Look at me, said the guard. But the man was afraid if he took his eyes off what now resembled the quivering lines of a gal galvanograph, he'd never find that familiar seascape again. Look at me, said the guard, and this time he stretched his hand and cupped the man's chin, encouraging him. He said his name once more, this time with more certainty, but his eyes remained fixed on the watery window. There was a bed of tiny fingers along the lower rim and a charm of eyes above them. Figures flurthered, expanding, pausing, contracting. He could almost feel the bodies moving forward, relaxing, then slowly beginning to spin. 
look at me. Instead, the man lowered his eyes and the aquarium faded into the twilight behind him. Before the island had visitors, the natives traveled easier on water than on land. The shoreline served only to launch, I'm sorry, the shoreline served only to launch and beach the smooth dugout shells of maca trees they shaped into canoes, each exactly the same and varying only in length. In spite of this, the islanders were terrible, unambitious mariners who rarely lost sight of the banks. They depended on the indented shoreline to create bays and lagoons to keep them close to home. Sometimes they'd wait for turtles to lay their eggs and rush to the sand and flip them on their backs. They'd steal the eggs and slaughter the mothers, fashioning the carapace into combs and hooks for fishing. They found their best trawling where the depths of the continental shelf didn't exceed more than 40 fathoms, where the waters were crystalline and warm and they could see the seabed drop to black. They used bows and arrows, bottom lining, rotting, spearing, sea nets, and fish pots to catch snapper, grouper, garfish, kingfish, lobster, tuna, and shrimp. They had gourds to bail the canoes, to gather rainwater for drinking, and to store their catch. They crafted nose rings, necklaces, and earrings from fish bones and shells, and used fish scales to make their bodies sparkle. They had no calendar, no writing system and they kept track of days by counting on their fingers and toes. The first visitors to the islands emerged from a tropical mist on three caravels, each sporting three lanteen sails angled against the wind. Each ship ran nearly 30 meters in length and weighed more than 90 tons, dwarfing the native canoes beside them. The glittery islanders stood uneasily on their tiptoes, trying to see beyond the caravels. Through grunts and signs, the new arrivals and the natives managed to establish some basic communication. We've come a long way, said the visitors. But how did you get here? Asked the islanders, the fish scales twinkling like tiny mirrors. We sailed on these big boats, said the visitors. What boats? We see no boats, responded the natives, still standing on their tiptoes, their canoes trembling on the waters. A Marco Rubio moment. <laughs> me tocaba a mí. The orange nylon wrapped around his ankle like seaweed. When he bent to pick it up, he saw there were still crumbs of cork inside. He tossed the torn vest, then pulled in his line to cast again. It was early, and the water was cool in the bay, the sky silvery. In an hour or two, he'd be able to see the black dot of the island in the distance. He straightened the line. He'd made the rod himself, a three meter bamboo he'd cut, trimmed, sanded, and hung for nine months. In that time, he'd eat boiled plantains and stare up at the long vertical cane as if in meditation. When he first took it down, he couldn't wait to put a line on it. He ran outside to his suburban yard and whipped it from side to side, the bamboo sizzling through the air. Now he wielded it as if he were stringing a bridge to heaven. The rod aimed, the line rose to the sky instead of the bay. The orange nylon floated back toward him in a bunch. He grabbed it. Then he saw a metal water bottle, its mouth open. An upside down tennis racket skimmed the surface, a box of saltines. He remembered the flight, how he'd pasted his face to the double panes of the window and lost count of the dark shapes in the water. His eyes followed the line of debris now, a magazine, a compass, the jagged edges of a torn foam flutter, a manila rope like an albino snake curling on the sandy bottom. One day, he stumbled on a tiny boat on the shore. He folded it like paper and took it home, setting it in his backyard. The next day, he returned to the same beach and found another craft, this one a long-sided wooden pentagon with slats across it. He dragged it from the water, tied it to the roof of his car, and took it home placing it next to the paper boat. The day after, he was passing by when he heard a rhythmic thumping and turned off the road, down a dirt path all the way to the water where he discovered a barge consisting of two long pontoons and a giant metal barrel hitting the rocks with each wave. 
He pulled it to the shore, then rented a trailer so he could take it home. This one, he positioned in the front yard. Later that week, he came home with a sloop made of balsa wood that had climbed the shore at high tide. Its skin was smooth as a baby's. Soon, other crafts found a home in his yard, canoes and kayaks, floats made of driftwood, hollow tree trunks, discarded refrigerators made buoyant with inflated tubes, car chassis with water wings, a green truck with propellers, inner tubes piled one on top of the other, filling his garage and blocking his driveway. There were dinghies and skiffs on the roof and in the neighbor's yards, on homemade trailers in the streets. He sold his bed and slept on a sail he'd strung up like a hammock in his room. By the time the new year rolled around, he was working three jobs to house the vessels in storage lockers and playgrounds, church parking lots and abandoned rural tracks, and a ga grassy yard behind a museum, even an airplane hangar. On Saturdays, he took flying lessons so that eventually he could reach them himself before their desolate landings. He would try to explain. He would come in and he would sit across from the good citizens. He showed them his check stubs from dishwashing, from dog grooming, told them he got paid in cash to pick tomatoes. He had plans for a tower that would display the crafts and tell their stories. And the good citizens, they nodded because they had grown used to his pleas. They would listen politely and then shake their heads. These are ghost tales, they'd say, phantom rafts. After a while, he'd scrape his chair back, get up, and leave. Far from the island, in an overgrown and flooded parcel, alligators rested in the shadow of the boats. Herons and egrets stepped gingerly through brackish water. Now and again, a grab rail or transom moaned as it came loose and eased into the muck. Sometimes a new raft, usually made from truck tubes and bed sheets, would float up by itself and wander away. In the distance, a plane began its descent. One day, just before sunset, he drove up wearing, wait, wearing wading boots and carrying a toolbox. He took a hammer and drill, and one by one, undid each and every vessel, piling the planks, stacking the tires, making a heap of the lawnmower motors, folding the fabrics left to right into triangles like a flag. Muchas gracias. You know, many of you may not know that our next writer is actually a native daughter as well. How many of you knew that? Did anybody, did any of you know that? Well, before, uh huh. Tanana Reeve Du, I first encountered her many, many moons ago uh, in her, in her uh, brilliant columns in, uh, in the Miami Herald's. She was a, she had a brilliant career as a journalist before she had even more brilliant career as a novelist. She is an, Ameri an American Book Award winner and an NAACP Image Award recipient as well. Take that. She is the author of 12 novels, including The Between and a memoir, Freedom in the Family a mother-daughter memoir of the fight for civil rights. Welcome back home, Tanana Reeve. Tanana Reeve Du. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adrian. Diem, welcome back. Evelina, thank you for helping me come home. And to my wonderful class of visionaries and dreamers and speculative fiction, I'm breaking with tradition. This is not new or in progress in, in any way, shape, or form. But the book is new. It's an upcoming collection of short stories. Not a lot of people have heard my short stories. This one, uh, the book is Ghost Summer. This short story is called The Knowing. All you need to know is that it's about a psychic who is mentally and financially unstable because she has one gift and one gift only. 
she can tell you the day you will die. It is not a big seller. The narrator is her 12-year-old son, Nikki. Mama tells me she was an ugly child coming up, always sassing back and running around where she wasn't supposed to be, sticking her nose in grown folks' business, and the knowing came as her punishment. God don't like ugly, she always tells me. She says that to scare me into acting right so I won't get punished the way she did, but that doesn't scare me. I wouldn't mind knowing the way she knows. I'd find a way to get rich from it instead of letting it drive me crazy like Mama does. <laughs> the day we had to move from Miami Beach, I had just aced a math test, no lie. I had the second highest score in the class. Answers come to me easy if I think hard enough. And on the way home from school, I was looking at the palm trees through the school bus window thinking it would be snowing if we were still living in Detroit like we did last winter. And when I walked through the door, Mama was sitting there on the sofa with a marble light. Damn, we're moving on, she said, pack a bag. <laughs> Her face was damp and there were little wads of toilet paper all over the floor like if there had been a parade. She'd been crying all day while I was in school again. You ain't working today? I asked her, hoping it wasn't what I thought. I like new places, but I didn't want to leave that time, not already. I've been fired, so we're moving. Rosa fired you, Mom? Mama, how come? Mama's face turned hard, and she dragged on her cigarette, sucking it like weed smoke. We had a fight, <laughs> Mama said. Oh, they know, they know. <laughs> they know. She blew the smoke out while she talked. She didn't have no right to say what she said about how I need help to take care of you right. I need to call big brothers or some mess, how I can't give you things like you need. You ain't none of her goddamn business. The funny thing is, I always wondered what it would be like to be in Big Brothers to have some dude who wears a suit to his job every day come play ball with me on weekends. It's not the same as a daddy, but it's better than nothing. But it's too bad for Rosa that she said that because mama gets pissed when people say she can't take care of me, especially after Atlanta. And she always has the last word in a fight. Once she gets mad, there is no keeping her quiet. So you told her? Just go throw your things in a bag, Nikki. I don't want to leave here, mama dang, I whined. I sounded like a baby, but I didn't care. Tell her you lied, you're sorry. Tell her you just made it up. I could see her hand holding the cigarette was shaking. Whenever mama smokes a cigarette, she always seems like she's about to drop it. New tears were running down her face. I don't know why I said that to Rosa. That wasn't right. Maybe she didn't mean nothing by it, but she made me so mad talking about you. I sat next to her on the couch and reached for her hand. She wouldn't squeeze back. Tell her it didn't mean nothing. We don't have to move just because of that. That ain't nothing. No, Nikki, Mama whispered. Telling to hurt somebody is the worst thing a person can do. Even the devil couldn't do no worse. I'd seen Mama acting crazy for sure, running around in her underclothes, screaming at anybody who could hear, but I'd never seen her quiet. That scared me more than it would have if she'd been throwing pots and pans on the floor. She sounded different. I got mad all of a sudden. Shoot, Mama, forget Rosa. Who does she think she is trying to say you can't take care of me? Nobody asked her. Mommy laughed a little and stared at the floor. You are taking care of me, Mama, better than anybody. Sure am, Mama said, still not looking up at me. I got to until May 12th. 2018, I said, squeezing her hand again. And Mama just closed her eyes. Until right then, when I heard myself say it, the date had seemed so far away. I'd known I would be 15 that year, but I'd never stopped to think it was only three years away. It wasn't so far off anymore. We left Miami Beach, which is too bad because it's so alive there. There's so many people who sing and dance and laugh and act like every day is the only one left. I wish we could have stayed there. Even in November, it's already freezing in Chicago and people are dressing warm, walking fast, waiting for spring to come. In a cold place, there's no such thing as today, just tomorrow. Will it snow tomorrow? Will it be sunny tomorrow? <laughs> but, but Mama says she couldn't face Rosa, so we jumped on a bus and stopped riding when we got bored. This time, we stopped in Chicago. But there's never really anywhere to go. 
I guess Mama felt so bad about what she said to Rosa because it reminded her of all the times before when she lost her temper and said what she doesn't mean to say. I don't think she can help it. I was only six when she did it to me. Even though I don't remember what I did that made her so mad in the first place, I was little, but I never forget what she said. I'll be through with your foolishness on May 12, 2018, <laughs> because that's your day, Nikki, you hear? I told, a f I told a friend once, a kid named Khalil I had just started hanging out with at my school in Atlanta after he told me about something bad that had happened to his family in the country where they were from. We were just standing on the playground and we told our worst stories. His story had soldiers. Mine was only about mama on May 12, 2018. <laughs> that was the only time anyone ever looked at me the way people always looked at mama. But the thing I like most about kids is that even though they get scared like anybody else, they can forget they're scared pretty fast. Especially kids like Khalil who know there's more to the world than video games and homework. I guess that made us alike. He hardly waited any time at all before he said, does that bother you? <laughs> Just like that. I never thought about that before. We were both 10 then, so 15 was five years off, half my whole life. And by that time, I'd be in high school, nearly a man, a whole different person. I told him I didn't think it bothered me. When you grow up around someone like Mama and you hear about it all the time, you know everybody has a turn. And you just try to find something interesting every day to make you glad it hasn't happened yet. That's why I didn't mind it in Miami Beach when the TV only got two channels. See, I don't need more than two channels as long as there's something I can watch. I'll watch the evening news and soap operas in English or Spanish or even golf if Tiger Woods is playing. <laughs> Hell, I don't even mind when we don't have a TV, which we usually don't. I read comic books and books from the library and take walks and watch people. Khalil said he wouldn't go to school if he were me, but I don't mind. There's always something interesting somewhere, even at school. Like the way my math teacher smiles when you can see her whole heart in it. I don't think anyone in my class has noticed that except me. You're really brave, Nikki, Khalil told me in Atlanta. I don't feel brave, but I do think about it sometimes. I wonder how it'll go down, if it will hurt when it happens, or if I'll be crossing the street and a car will come around a corner all of a sudden, like with my dad, Uncle Joe. Or maybe I'll see someone getting robbed, and I'll get shot like Auntie Ree when I try to stop the bad guy, and someone will say I was a hero. That would be best. I wonder if it'll happen even if I stay in bed that day and never leave my room, or I'll just get struck by lightning while I'm staring out of my window at the greatest storm I've ever seen. I never get sick, so I don't think it'll be that. I think it'll be something else, but I'm not sure what. Even Mama says she doesn't know. Thank you. Take that. Imagine hearing that reading on May 11th. <laughs> Next writer, what can I, s I say about Chris? Onifade. <laughs> Chris is, uh, I, met, I met Chris, I don't know, maybe about uh, seven, eight years ago or so, on a reading he gave on Lincoln Road, uh, the uh, book fair, Miami, the Miami book fair brought him over, and that's when I first met him, but, but when we really got to bond was uh, over in Port Townsend, in, uh, in, um, at the, yeah, Port Townsend at the uh, writers' conference there some years back and ever since then we struck a very very uh good friendship i would say that i would i would say that he is my brother <laughs> mr chris abani is a novelist a poet an essayist a screenwriter a playwright, <laughs> a saxophone player, <laughs> and for those of you 
who have gone through him. Because it's an experience. He's the author of Graceland, Santificum, one of my all-time favorite books of poems, of poetry, and Becoming Abigail. His most recent novel is The Secret History of Las Vegas. Please welcome Chris Abani. Look, there's a cup holder for me. Good evening. I wasn't even supposed to be here this week. <clears throat> but um, when DM calls, you answer. <laughs> Otherwise, he hits you with a cane. Uh, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> anyway, it's been a, a privilege to be here. Um, I've been working with nine incredible women, and it's, it's just been wonderful. Yeah. And Yeah. It <laughs> <laughs> and um, because I'm such a cheerful motherfucker, we, we talk about death all the time. <laughs> so, I, so I thought, you no, know, we've been talking about the way in which art, all art is really, is really um, a meditation on how to die well. Um, so, so I thought I would read two sections, short sections from two different novels um, that are about dying. But, but, but it's about... Um, Death is love, you know, not, not, not in the ways we think about it. Anyway, so the first one is from um, The Secret History of Las Vegas, which is a book, among many things, about uh, conjoined twins who may or may not be serial killers, because why not? And, uh, <laughs> and the opening section is where you meet the twins and their mother for the first time. And then a short scene, a uh, short section from, can you hear me? Right, from becoming Abigail. Uh, and so Abigail, Abigail is a young woman whose mother dies giving birth to her, but she looks so much like her mother, she's given her mother's name, and she spends her life collecting stories about her mother and tattooing them all over her body. Um, and, she ha and so her father begins to confuse her for his wife, and to protect her from him, he, he does a beautiful thing. Um, so I'm just going to read through. Um, so the section from The Secret History is called Bristlecone. This hands cannot do, even interlaced across a pregnant woman's stomach, even if the will that webs the fingers desires nothing more than to protect the unborn in her. Not even this is sufficient to form a barrier against the flash of light and a cloud that grows not into a mushroom, but rather into a thick tree with a dense plume, a tree to shame Odin's, a tree to make Adam cover the inadequacies of his, a tree even Shiva would stand back from in awe. And bright, a constellation, no, a rogue star, a renegade sun, the very face of awe. And if there are true names for divinity, then that too. As Sila watched the cloud mushroom up, she wondered if the babies in her womb were lit by the incandescence before her. And had they beheld all this glory, and what would it shape in them when they were born? A penetrating insight into mystery, a desire for a life untinged by the fear of death, or eyes that see only constellations, only truth. But the warnings led in other directions. The oracle spoke mostly of death, of darkness, of eclipse. But could she mold even this cloud into a defiant sign, a promise of good things? Perhaps the tone seems heavy, Old Testament weighted, but until you have seen this power bloom in a desert, you can never fully understand the truths that made Elijah weep or Elisha wail and despair for his people. You cannot know the terrible loneliness of Moses, the crying Gethsemane. But sometimes simpler words can do the same work. And watching the explosion of a nuclear bomb in the Nevada desert from a spot less than two miles from its sky obliterating epicenter, Sila said, shit, I'm fucked. And she was. Her babies were born fused like the glass formed by the chattering of Sanjin. We can't operate here, the doctor said as he placed the bundle in her arms, but we could ask the doctors on the army base. They have the best minds and equipment. The idea of it, an unspeakable insult, that those who had did this should be begged to undo it, curdled the milk in her. No, she said, no. They were born this way for a reason, and she named one water for the living waters from the throne and the other one fire because his very existence was the curse she would use to end them. 
The boys were still young, barely seven, when the sickness began. Leukemia. The word itself conjured up only a deep royal blue in her mind, beautiful like a Nile lotus, which she couldn't know because she had never seen one, but blue, like the angle of light on Lake Mead at a certain time and place on a certain summer day. Terminal. The word rattled like the gates of a crypt, all rust and the smell of decay, but also conjuring adventure. A train pulling into a station on an evening in Casablanca or roaring through a dark desert. It's lit carriages pulling through the night like a spell, an affirmation that it can all mean something. At 18, she got pregnant from a boy on the nearby army base who promised to marry her, but who shipped off soon after her belly began to show, and she never heard from him again. And many people have come back from worse, so Sila, like everyone in the dusty town of Gabriel, soldiered on, but her leukemia and the closing of the diner where she worked sealed everything into a premature death. Now there was nothing left for her but the glass case, the display that old Dan the mechanic had built her from the scraps he could spare. It was a curious thing, this glass box more terrarium than fish tank, four foot tall and four foot wide, glass bolted together as though by Dr. Frankenstein, with a sluggish fan powered by a car battery cut into the back panel, struggling to move the Nevada air. Sila sat with this box every day, dressed like a carnival gypsy, under a large 7-Eleven beach umbrella, the terrarium by the table, a deck of tarot cards before her, offering readings for a dollar. And for three dollars, the chance to look under the velvet cloth draped over the terrarium at the monster inside. More often than not, people chose the monster. And she would slowly peel back the green velvet drape to reveal the conjoined seven-year-old twins sitting or sometimes standing in the tank, one reading, the other holding court loudly, until annoyed by a particularly careless onlooker, he would crawl under his cowl and hide. And that was how the years went by, she getting sicker, the twins getting bigger, until water couldn't stand in the tank anymore, but sat cross-legged at the bottom, still reading, always reading. And fire held rapid-fire philosophical debates with customers while water read, pausing only occasionally when prodded to engage, to look up and speak in simple facts like, only humans and horses have hymens, or <laughs> cold, <laughs> cold water weighs more than hot. Their fame, if one can call this fame, spread, and soon tourists were stopping over just to see them. And it wasn't long before a traveling circus came by, actually more sideshow than circus, truth be told. The owner, a Mr. Jacobs, paid $100 to see the twins. It's more than you need to pay, Sela said. As you can see, we're alike, Mr. Jacobs said, you and I, parents to some, what some might call freaks, but what I like to think of as marvels of the Lord's creativity. And in my sideshow, all the marvels are natural, he boasted. Why, that's why we travel under that name, Jacob on the Lord's marvels, he explained, himself a man with what looked like lobster claws where his hands should be. And we're all like a family, he added. We are, the midget with him said, we are a family. And Sila thought that the midget had the saddest eyes she had ever seen. Mr. Jacob offered Sela a very good deal to take the boys and look after them, teach them how to have a life in his show, and in exchange he would pay for her to live in a hospice until she passed in her sleep. She demurred and coughed blood into a handkerchief, a clump of her hair falling out disgracefully as she did. If you won't have the money, what will you have? And Sela glanced at the blood in her handkerchief. The boys were twelve and water was smarter than she would ever be. Swear on this blood to treat them like your own, she said. I sure will, Mr. Jacobs said, offering a lobster claw. And here is my own daughter so that you may see that I am true. And a tall girl, slender as a wisp of smoke, walked forward. How old are you? Sela asked. Twelve, the girl said. And your name? Fred. And that seemed to cement it for her. Although to confirm, Sela drew a card and laid it face up. The hanged man. She sighed, infinitely sad. Come by my house tomorrow, she said. It's five miles from the town under the blue-barked bristle cone. Mr. Jacobs nodded. That night, through bouts of coughing and much blood spat into handkerchiefs, Silas sang the boys to sleep with their favorite lullaby. Then kissing them on the cheek, she let herself out just before dawn when the mist was still upon the ground and dragging a length of rope behind her, walked up the slight rise behind the house to the bristle cone tree. Becoming Abigail. Then, 
This was how she found her father, hanging, the week she was to leave with Peter, hanging, from the hook where the ceiling fan had been. And now a cruel breeze blew in and he swayed in the raveling and unraveling of the hemp rope, round and around like a lazy Christmas ornament. And down one leg and pulling on the floor, his reluctance, yellow, and in the heat, putrid, rank with him, his life, his loss, and she didn't cry, didn't seem shocked, knew, always knew. It was more a matter of when and how. She sat on the floor beneath him, felt his toe brush her cheek with every turn, turn by turn, his big toe spiced with his urine, and the uncut toenail rough on her face, sharp enough to cut, cut a small line, line linking her to him, him held only by that line, falling, falling from the ceiling in hemp, hemp becoming flesh, flesh the fluid of him leaking, leaking down his leg, leg ending in the toe, toe brushing her cheek with a cut, Cut the line, cut the line, line the rope. Rope saw voices calling, falling heavy in the dust around her, her sitting on the floor, floor where his crumpled body was laid on the heart of concrete, concrete falling away into the soft of loam, and he falling, falling into Abigail, Abigail, her sitting on the floor, losing him, him losing her, her, she, she, the reason for him doing this, this love, love calling to love. She sitting on the floor, floor patterned by the footprints of those voices who cut him down, down from the line. She dipped her finger in the pool of him and brought it to her lips, the salt of him, the sum of him. There is no way to leave anything behind. She soaked her hands in him, brought them wet and shiny in the sunlight to her face and smeared. But water is just that. Nothing left behind but the prickle of his evaporation and the faint fragrance of loss. Loss. She knew this, knew this, knew this. This wasn't grief. Grief wasn't the measure. Joy 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 shameless shameful abandoned released she rolled in it it coated her in liquid and dust there was no line just this wet muddy smudge of him and the spent form of her and she leaned back and she laughed thank you You know, around these parts, they say that, uh, you know, if a Cuban goes to the middle of uh, the Sahara Desert, or he's in the center of the United States, the Montana, he'll find another Cuban. And so, Cubans say, everywhere you go, you're bound to find a Cuban, right? Los cubanos están en todas partes. Well, you know, I would say, judging by the roster here and the, and the reading tonight, Nigerians are everywhere. <laughs> Naija. <laughs> because they're back to back. <laughs> Faith Adiele. is a non-fiction writer, teacher, and speaker. She is the author of the Nigerian Nordic Girl's Guide to Lady Problems <laughs> and Meeting Faith, a travel memoir about becoming Thailand's first black Buddhist nun. Would you please welcome Faith Adiele. <laughs> wow, look at Chris and Tanana Reeve cheating by reading stuff that was finished. <laughs> Making us look so bad. Oh man, I was so scared. I'm normally not scared at all. Um, so let me just kind of postpone this a little bit. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank some people. Uh, I would like to thank 
Vanessa and Kira and their incredibly beautiful, charming daughters. Our new family members, Santi and, oh my God, I'm looking at you. Alejandro. Bearded guy. <laughs> Alejandro. Yay, thank you so much. Um, Diem and my dear friend Elmaz for taking a chance on me eight years ago and finding a home, uh, inviting me into the Vona family, which literally changed my life. Um, for real, for real. Uh, I got a nutty husband out of the deal. Um, Evelina for being an incredible hostess, um, got me a wonderful residency at the Betsy and then opened her home up to me. And then on top of that, hosted a wonderful faculty dinner for us where I used all my energy trying to out Nigerian uh, Chris Abani. <laughs> Which is why I've got nothing today. <laughs> I literally have nothing. I knew what I was going to read and then I was like, oh shit, this one takes a Nigerian accent. I'm all Nigerian out. So that's why I'm actually reading something that new, which I never do, which I just wrote, which is terrifying, um, for my incredible travel writing class. Woo! That's right. Because um, I know we're the underdogs, um, <laughs> which I don't understand, because we're people of color, and every time we leave the house, we travel. No one travels more than we do. That's right. So this is just basically me being bitchy. <laughs> you are traveling, or rather clicking, jealous, incredulous, cranky, through a white acquaintance's endless Facebook posts of her global jet-setting junkets. There she is, striking carefree, sexy poses all around the world, next to the same blonde, tanned, laughing, hard-drinking friends who get all the travel writing gigs and awards. There she is, striking disturbingly sexy posts next, poses next to her teenage daughter. There's an essay there, you think. <laughs> Your finger hesitates over her African safari album. Don't do it, you tell yourself. You've been down this road before. You're going to hate her and yourself. Complete this sentence. I'm dying to go to Africa to... A, see the animals. B, help the people. <laughs> C, help the animals. <laughs> what is the tone of the paragraph? You can't help yourself. You double click on the animals of Africa. <laughs> it's the usual parade of East African and Southern African wildlife, a veritable open air zoo, and for her, unusually free of photo sex bomb sexy photo bombing. But her caption surprises you. She has listed collective nouns for it, the animals of Africa. There's a poem here, you think. A dazzle of zebras, a leap of leopards, a flamboyance of flamingos, a journey of giraffes, a bloat of hippos, a troop of baboons, a crash of rhinos, a shrewdness of apes. You relax, tasting the beauty of your continent's fauna on your tongue, more textured than any travel tale, more brilliantly colored than any National Geographic photograph. You try to decode the system, the pattern of alliteration, assonance, and consonance of dazzling zebras, flamboyant flamingos, journeying giraffes. The onomatopoeic promise of danger, with hippos bloating, baboons trooping, rhinos crashing. You dive deep into the black hole of internet research, where in mere minutes you confirm, much to your chagrin, that 80% of all safari travel blogs have discovered this same list of collective nouns. <laughs> but still, you're intrigued, because the names of things matter. Even if this tradition of venery, specific nouns of assembly, comes from English hunting culture, and even if English hunting language comes from medieval France, dark estates filled with the severed heads and taxidermied animals, it was probably like the luxury lo lodge you and your students unwittingly found yourselves in near Bloemfontein, surrounded by enormous, angry-looking white South Africans, glassy-eyed taxidermy on every table, shelf, and wall. Is there a way to count, categorize, name things, 
not in order to shoot or otherwise claim them? Complete this sentence. I'm dying to go to Africa to D, pay off the dictator to extract mineral resources. E, pay off the NGO to run drug trials and stop, stop FGM. F, pay off the church to fight homosexuality and polygamy. G, see the animals. <laughs> what is the tone of the paragraph? You should like to remind these folks dying to go to Africa that there are animals to shoot or rescue, black and brown bodies to enslave or feed, priceless minerals to steal, dangerous pharmaceuticals to test, gays to bash, women and girl children to rescue right here, right down the street, and colorful, exotic, weird, bizarre, strange, foreign terms of venery for animals and humans found in those houses and parks and empty lots right down the street. For example, a mischief of mice. <laughs> a clouder or glaring of cats. A gaze of raccoons. A rabble of butterflies. A skulk of foxes. A shiver of sharks. You imagine your backyard transformed into the savanna. Beneath a gaze of raccoons, your glaring of cats contemplates a mischief of mice. <laughs> a skulk of foxes happens upon a rabble of butterflies. Hilarity ensues. <laughs> Several blocks away at the edges of the inner city and the Central American immigrant enclave shots ring out. Don't be fooled into thinking the tradition of venery, specific nouns of assembly, offers the right to free assembly. Large animals like you are always game. And despite its bloody, problematic origins, you should still like to do something with a dazzle, a leap, a flamboyance, a journey, a bloat, a troop, a crash. But those who assign all the travel writing gigs and awards to the same carefree, blonde, tanned, laughing, hard drinking friends don't need a downer like you. Someone pointing out the dead busts and bodies hanging on the walls of history. Don't need you remarking on the color of who's eating versus who's serving the barbecued zebra, ostrich, kudu, wildebeest in the candlelit dining room. Your downerness started freshman year when you were drowning and flung yourself into a speed reading course and ruined it for everyone. You hadn't meant to, had only asked sincerely on index cards the instructor distributed at the end of class how the correct answer to the reading comprehension question, what is the tone of the paragraph about primitive aborigines finally becoming civilized, could be C, respectful. <laughs> Scholarship students just like you started complaining that your questions were making them think about what they were reading. <laughs> And as a result, their reading speeds were dropping. <laughs> this is what the opposite of what they had signed up for. The black female instructor begged you to drop the class, the oldest class at Harvard, the oldest university in America. It was too late to save the primitive aborigines. Please sacrifice yourself for the greater good. <laughs> so you, age nine, took a walkabout. One, an informal public stroll taken by members of the royal family, or by a political figure for the purpose of greeting and being seen by the public. Or two, a brief informal leave from work taken by an aborigine to wander the bush, visit relatives, or return to native life. Or three, a rite of passage during which adolescent male Australian aborigines undergo a journey and live in the wilderness for a period of six months. Tell me, what is the goddamn tone of the paragraph? Yes, you, age 19, asked to walk away from the oldest university in America, took a walkabout, the sound and smell of animal betrayal lingering, a reminder of the only venery that matters, a shrewdness of apes. Right about 1991 or so, the likes of Willie Perdomo 
came around these parts, <laughs> specifically uh, Lincoln Road. And uh, I happened to be on the same bill as him and several of the uh, New Yorkian poets. They were coming down here, I think maybe one of them, maybe for the first time or something, as, as, as a group. And that's when I met uh, Willie. And uh, we, we struck this uh, affinity uh, ever since. We lost track of each other for several years, but, uh, but for uh, several years now, we've been, we've been, you know, communicating and stuff. So Willie uh, has, uh, is the author of the essential hits of Shori Bonbon. <laughs> The essential hits of Shori Bonbon. Smoking Lovely, which is the winner of the Penn's, uh, Penn uh, Beyond Margins Award. And Will a Nickel Costs a Dime. A finalist for the Poetry Society of America's Norma Farber First Book Award. Please welcome Willie Perdomo. Hell, man. Yo, so uh, it's been a long time, right? And uh, give it up for Adrian, yo, for the, for the job that he's doing hosting tonight. And I, uh, I know of no better compliment to a poet's life than being an acupuncturist, I think, at this point, right? So... Uh, it's good to see you, man. Uh, Diem, Elmaz, uh, Evelina, thank you for, for bringing Bona to yet another horizon at this point. And uh, we're going to be here for, I think, a couple more years, right? So <laughs> let's do this. Um, uh, big up to my poetry class, right? Yeah. Um, so... <laughs> So we went out and found a sandbank, and uh, we went out and found a sandbank in Key Biscayne, and pretty much circled up on the sandbank and just kind of kicked it. Um, and I found out that I have a class of like, uh, thanks to uh, Fati, uh, immortal jellyfishes and shit, right? right. So, so what I'm gonna do is. Um, I'm going to just read some selections, basically all from the uh, voice of Rose. And Rose is Shorty Bonbon's love. Um, I've always been interested in the, uh, the conceit of the singular love. And I've always wondered what the poems would sound like from uh, the, uh, the subject of that love. Um, so Rose has a say in a few poems. It's called, uh, the poems are called Dear Shorty, and they're all takes because it's a book about musician. And then I'm going to finish uh, with some outtakes from the book, basically, because it's a book about musician. It's a jam session. And I think Rose is going to come back and kind of try to really go in on um, a book called Another Kind of Open. Um, which is taken from Audre Lorde's uh, poem called Cole. I think she says, love is another kind of open. Yes. Um, so I'll read through the Dear Shorty poems, and then I'll read from another kind of open. So I'll reverse it, right? Like, oh shit, new shit, right? <laughs> Dear Shorty, I'll read through. <laughs> Listen to the key. Love me. Pay for your life up front. Let me eat. From every tree, no judgment eyes. Be crystal, crash into me like a new star, like the ground rips open just for us. Act like you know my name. Whatever you say has to eat water and dance. Be gentle when you talk. Pretend that you, that you got kicked in the head by a mule. And when you lost vision, the first thing you heard was my song. Her name is Rose, by the way. And if you saw me falling, what would you yell from the great street? 
What is all this shit you talk about when you talk about love? This zoo bang, this fun house could be swing, could be slide, this ball, this diesel. What is this thing you call cure and sickness? Tell me, tell me if you feature or go first, what good is reason to the last set? When you read the stains at the bottom of my coffee cup, be careful. You might feel more like a monster than a tree. And what looks like a monster is really a tree. If I had a license, you might say true. You might say that all the beautiful discoveries usually come late to the party. <laughs> Fuck with me and I will give you passage on layaway. <laughs> I will make you drop to your knees in after party silence until your dreams are overcrowded. I will be the mosquito in your eye at last glance. Make you scream in your sleep until the lyrics on my lips turn to ice. Until your last whereabouts are so unknown that each fig will be put to rest and your heart can't find a corner to stand on. In my new healing, I learned that we are all sick. To start, you begin here and end up where you've always been. The dream cry stay in the background, the crashing sound of best against you. What cleaner stage to be invisible, to be chosen. The charms and laws change faster than curtains. When you come, come dressed in mid-promise. Anything, anything but the past. Please, just a clean scrape, no stones. I hear you can find mistakes in heaven. So these are the outtakes. This is what, end up, what ended up on the cutting room floor, right? So, uh, and I'm going to use that shit, too. I'm going to... Um, <laughs> so this is from another kind of open. And I think this is still Rose. I'm almost certain. <laughs> it's hot in here, right? It's, it's getting hot here. It's all yours. I see people like just fanning themselves, and so um, <laughs> congratulations, man, to Vona, 16 years, man, and we're still rocking out, yeah. yeah. All right, so this is another kind of open. Even now, when I'm asked, I'm fast on a shade of brown. Butter going soft, a boot stuck in mud, talking shit. You wrote poems for a year like I was never there. Was there, loud, out loud. I tried to tell you, doubled or repeated. Your last verses were close to fire. Type Gucci, kind of like your lyric, was all dressed up with no party to crash. When we met, you swore love was the true civil rights issue. The blue in the morning, you would look for my body's government like I was your primary source. All these years later, you still taking bows, working for claps. You need to stop with the word shots. If you had a chance to say you got this, you would run. Throw roses, sink hearts, a love note in a paper bag. My mother used to always say, if he leans to talk, watch him. Watch him like you would watch that which you said you had seen, but promised never to look as directed. Maybe take all the good measures, check my spelling, get a hem cut right, slap your books on the table when you make them. But tonight, it's an open year, to fly. I wish I had a copy, beloved. This one I give off the top. First Christmas, we had to remove our socks before we entered the cheer. The tidings and our saints had grown beards, enough eggnog to get a party started. That feeling, that night when you can only think of lies in different shoe sizes, kisses, 
hopping. If you really love me the way you swore you love me, when I call, when I wake, and it's you and my first open eye, I can start by saying that I'm not a poet, but I can see. Thank you. Can we say wow? wow. <laughs> we always are going to hug a mug of joy. But you know, I heard somebody say something about fanning themselves because they thought maybe it was church-like or it was hot or somebody was having hot flashes. But what we're doing here today is celebrating. This is articulations. We've heard from Willie. We've heard from Tana Reeve. We've heard from Evelina. We've heard from Faith. We've heard from Chris. We've heard from Ache. But you know? Andrew. Andrew. <laughs> but you know what makes this work? Our families, our commitment to our craft. But what makes it work this week is the staff. And I like the staff of the Vona Voices to stand. <laughs> You know, we're not done this week. This is a high point. Thank you all for coming out. Um, I have a couple of announcements I'd like to make. Um, before you all leave tonight, Chris Avani's residency group, come up here afterwards. I'm going to take a uh, group photograph. Um, also, if anyone is interested in purchasing one of the faculty readers' books, the cashiers over here on the left, um, they've got selections from everyone, and also then um, the authors will be signing books over here in the room on the right. And oh, and faculty, you can't leave the room until you come up here right now so we can take a fa faculty group shot. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. The night is young, and Mitch, you know, so what, it's hot. It's Miami, and we love it. Thank you. Folks, as Mr. Jones mentioned, we have signing on the west side and books for sale over here. I got one more favor to ask of you folks, since the room is so full, if when you got up you folded your chair and stacked it against the wall, that would be a big help in getting us this room emptied out. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.